Bienvenue tout le monde à cette nouvelle conférence Cérébrum en présentiel. Euh, donc, c'est un immense honneur pour moi de vous présenter Marie Kémur. Et euh, je vais laisser le soin à Yann Charret, qui la connaît bien mieux que moi, de, de la présenter de façon correcte. Alors, Yann. Oui. Euh, je vais présenter Marie-Pierre en anglais. Elle va nous donner euh, sa présentation en anglais aussi. Donc, Marie a fait une maîtrise, a mérité master's in uh, cognitive neuroscience at Maastricht uh, University in the Netherlands, um, and then moved on to um, do a PhD uh, at the NIH with uh, Nico Figuescotte and Peter Bandettini. Um, during her time there, she uh, invented a new technique called uh, representational similarity analysis, together with Nico and Peter. Um, and um, following from that, she moved to uh, Cambridge, where she did a postdoc with uh, John Duncan um, and studied vision in humans, but also in um, yeah, non-human primates. And, um, and she's now an assistant professor at Western Ontario. Um, Marike and I overlapped in Cambridge uh, during many years. Uh, we had really nice dinners, um, vegetarian food. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> um, yeah, she's, she's extremely uh, bright um, and very nice to, um, to chat to. So, Um, there will be refreshments after the talk. Stay around and, and try to um, grab a word with Marike. She's an extraordinary person. So with all this, I, um, I'm very excited to hear what uh, Marike has been uh, working on in the uh, past years. Um, and um, I give you the stage. Thank you. Yeah, great. Thank you for that nice introduction and for inviting me here. Uh, it's really great to be here and give a talk. Um, I'm probably going to just keep wearing my mask. I've got used to that. You know, we have to teach with that as well. So um, uh, I am just going to start. So what I did want to say is if you have any questions during the talk, feel free to ask them. Uh, because I, of course, made some estimate of your prior background knowledge. But in case something isn't clear, then feel free to interrupt me. Um, so the title of my talk is Modeling Representational Transformations in the Human Visual System. So one of the big questions that my lab has been uh, busy answering over the last years is how does the brain extract meaning from visual input? So it seems quite easy to do this in terms of our personal experience. So once you open your eyes, you immediately know where you are, what objects are around. Uh, but if you think about the brain, it's actually kind of a difficult computational task that the brain is accomplishing. Because you can imagine, I don't really have an example here, or maybe this pen, um, you know, if you look at this, object over here that if you see it from this view, it looks very different than when I turn it around. And we somehow, for example, need to abstract from that variability uh, to be able to identify this same pen across these different conditions. Um, we also have the same thing if we think about categories. So it's very helpful to categorize objects, for example, say, oh, this is a face or this is a dog, um, because then we can generate the same behavioral response to these different objects. So there we also need to abstract from some variability, so that's within category variability, in order to be able to categorize. And all of these abstractions, somehow we need to do that without still losing the ability to also uh, discriminate individual exemplars, because we do want to recognize individual people, for example. So that's actually not so easy. <laughs> so how does this work? So usually uh, what happens when we see a stimulus like this, this apple, And uh, we get brain responses in response to that stimulus, <coughs> specifically in occipital and ventral cortices. So that's more here. And um, that's regions that are involved in visual processing. And then usually associated with this activity, there's also a response that's being generated that's appropriate for the particular situation and behavioral goal that we have. For example, we may grab the apple because we may be hungry and want to eat it. Um, but today I'm going to mostly talk about this part. How do we actually get from this image to some meaningful representation that's somehow computed by the brain. All right, so a little bit more detail. We're going to focus today on the ventral visual stream. And that's something you may have heard about before. So this is a particular set of brain regions in the occipital and temporal cortices 
that's involved in computing these meaningful representations. So as you can see, what we get basically is light, and that's hitting our retinas. Then information travels through the LGN to V1, which is the first cortical station of information processing, and then gets processed further and goes up the visual stream to V2, V4, and IT. So IT stands for inferior temporal cortex, and this is a higher level visual region that we know is important for object recognition. So today we're going to have three parts to the talk, plus some sort of bonus at the end, let's say. So the three parts are, first I'm going to talk about how we investigate population codes. And with population codes, I mean patterns of activity across either neurons or maybe voxels, if you measure that with fMRI, um, that carry information about, for example, visual stimuli that we're seeing. The second, once we understand how we can analyze these population codes, we can use those tools to characterize what type of object information is represented in higher level visual cortex. And with that, by the way, I mean IT, so the end stage, let's say, of processing. And then the last part that we'll get to is the representational transformations. So how do we actually get from the image to that higher level representation in IT? And that's where also deep neural networks will come in. So let's start with the first part, investigating population codes. So uh, let's imagine we want to know how the brain represents images. And what we did uh, to answer that question is to present these images to participants in an fMRI scanner. So just they were viewing these images. You can see them from different categories. So there's humans, both faces and also bodies, animals, natural objects, which is um, vegetables, fruits, natural scenes, and man-made objects. So these are more like tools or buildings, quite a wide range. Um, so now what we do, when we measure responses to these images across the different stages of visual processing, um, we can uh, use what Jan referred to, this type of analysis, representational similarity analysis, uh, to characterize what type of information different brain regions are representing about these images. So the way in which we do that is to, for each pair of images, measure response patterns in the brain. So that can be in whichever brain region we're interested in. For us, we're gonna look at IT. Then we can compute the dissimilarity between these response patterns. And we can store this in a matrix, a representational dissimilarity matrix or RDM. And what that matrix will contain is the dissimilarities and response patterns to all the different pairs of images that we can make based on the images that we showed the participants. So you can see along the axes we have the stimuli. Now imagine, oh, that's also what I'm going to show you, that we measure activity across IT, so the higher level region. Here are the stimuli, they're a bit small now, but they're the same as I just showed you. And they're ordered, as you can see, according to the categories. So that's on the axis here. And now we're also going to color code the, the similarities because there will be many of them. Um, and you know that's all easier to see when you color code them than when you have numbers. So blue is going to mean low dissimilarities. That means that two images elicited very similar response patterns. And the opposite is the case for red or yellow. Those are dissimilar. So what we already know is that we will get a diagonal of zeros um, because that's a response pattern compared to itself. We also know the matrix is going to be mirror symmetric about that diagonal of zeros. So for each individual pair, it will contribute two of these entries. They're identical to each other. And for the faces, which we expect to elicit somewhat similar response patterns, I've just already put in my hypothesis basically blue color, low dissimilarity. Now, if we change the, the face, for example, to a banana, which is different, um, and we also think not only different in visual properties, but also in terms of the category that it belongs to. For example, it's edible, right? And um, so you can see that the expectation there is orange, so there would be different response patterns. So now I'm gonna show you the actual data. And it is data from four human participants and we averaged across the participants at the level of the dissimilarities. So here we see the data. 
first one we see is there is quite some structure in this data. This is one thing that immediately jumps out. And that is that whenever you have an object that's animate and an object that's inanimate, so not alive, you can see that you see warmer colors. So that means they elicit different response patterns. And then we also see this small, very blue square. These are human faces. So they elicit quite similar response patterns across this high level visual region. Now we can also visualize this in a different way um, using multidimensional scaling. And that's a technique to reduce the dimensionality of this representation uh, so that we can actually show distances or dissimilarities between the objects in two dimensions with the least possible distortion. So here are the images. And what we see now is the distance between them reflects how different their response patterns are. So the further they are apart, the more different their response patterns. And we can also color code uh, these images according to the category they belong to. And you can see that indeed, we clearly see this animate inanimate division and also the human faces within the animates. So it's just a different way of visualizing that maybe slightly more intuitive. Now, this is nice. So this way of doing things gives us an idea of what kind of information the brain region may be emphasizing about the stimuli and what it may be de-emphasizing. Um, what's also very nice about this is that we can actually do the same thing for a model. And of course, we're interested in modeling the brain uh, to better understand how it works. And we can have a whole range of different models. Could be conceptual models. Maybe those would be labels of features and categories. It could also be computational models like deep neural networks. And then in each of these models, we can also compute response patterns. For example, across features or across categories or across units in a layer in a network. And then we can do the same thing as we do for the brain. And then at that level of the representational dissimilarity matrices, we can compare the two to each other. And we can say how, how much of the variance in the brain representation is explained by the model. And of course, usually you have multiple models, so you can now compare how well each of them does. And then we can also have different brain representations that we compare to each other, could be different subjects, could be different brain regions. Uh, and behavior, we can ask how much the brain can explain behavior. So that would, for example, be similarity judgments that people generate for these object images. So now we have these tools in our in hand, right? Now we can ask more about the object representation in high level visual cortex. So we already saw that what's represented there are categories that have some ecological relevance. So that's faces, animate objects, but we haven't really talked about how uh, the, the high level visual cortex maybe actually um, gets into that object representation. So what is it computing that leads to the representation that we see? Now there's, you could say maybe two slightly competing hypotheses in the literature. In the monkey electrophysiology literature, we know that visual features of intermediate complexity, so this is object parts or textures, they explain response variance um, in IT. And then we also know, and this is more so from humans, um, that category membership also drives responses in these high level regions. So they may both matter, right? But it's not been uh, really clear which of these two is more important and how they relate to each other. So what we did, and this is with Camilla Dosnik, who was a P2 student at the time, um, we um, collected from human observers descriptions of these objects that we were showing to uh, participants in the scanner. And we asked them to generate either labels for visual features. So here are some examples for this apple that people generated or categories at different levels of abstraction. So now we can create models, one for features, one for categories. Now I'm going to show you how we did that. And um, so here I'm going to talk about the visual feature model, but we did the same thing for the category model. So what you can see here is that we have the images on the y-axis, and then we have the descriptions or labels that people provided on the x-axis. 
And black just indicates that that particular feature is present and white means it wasn't, it was absent. So now I'm gonna zoom out, show you the entire model because there's many images and also many features. Um, so what we now see here is that each of these images, its row is a response pattern across features. And we could now compute RDMs again based on these response patterns. There's one thing I need to add though, and that is that maybe not all features are equally important in explaining representational variance in the brain data. So what we did additionally is that we weighted these features according to their importance for explaining brain data. And we determined that using independent data. And then we use those weights to make our model a bit better. And then it looks more like this. And now we compute predictions at the level of the RDMs that the model generates. And then we have the actual data. So this is all schematic, right? The actual data, and of course, there's going to be some residuals that the models may not explain. Now let's show you what we actually find when we do this. So I'm going to show you predictions of the IT object representation. This is the data, the actual IT um, data. And here are the model predictions. So um, this is for the categorical model. And you can see that there is definitely some similarity between its predictions and the actual data. So we see, for example, that the inanimate uh, cluster, right, that's over here, this part, uh, we also see human faces over there. <laughs> and so you can see there are some similarities. It doesn't fully capture the representation in IT, but certainly explains some of it. So here, this is features, um, somewhat similar, somewhat different, a little bit clearer um, human face cluster there, and also faces in general. So these are animate faces of animals, basically. And then these, these smaller squares, are um, pairs of an animal face and a human face. So it tends to group them all together in the category of faces. And then we also looked at a combined model. So this includes all the features and all the categories, because you could imagine that maybe if they each explain different components of the variance in the data, maybe they'll do better if they're combined. Now let's quantify that. We can correlate right, the models um, with the data. So that's what's going to be shown here on the y-axis. And what I'm also showing here is this gray bar. And the gray bar represents the noise ceiling. So this is an estimate of the performance of the unknown true model uh, given the noise in the data. Because since the data is noisy, even the true model may not yield a correlation of one. And here we get an estimate of what the unknown true model would actually yield. And then we know that that's where we want to end up. We want our models to be in the noise ceiling. Then they're good models. So is that what we're going to find? Let's see. Um, so let's first look at features. So the features are over here. What's good to see is that they are significantly correlated with the um, brain data. But we can also see that they it doesn't really reach the noise ceiling. So there's still variance left unexplained. Now the categories, they have a slightly higher absolute correlation coefficient, but they're actually not significantly different in their performance uh, from the features in explaining the IT representation. So now what about the combined model? So I'm going to show that over here. What do you think is going to happen? Is it going to be better? Yeah. Okay, let's see. Actually, it isn't. <laughs> it's not better. It's not significantly different from the other two. So in some ways that uh, we, we thought maybe this would happen, right? So maybe, uh, but what does it mean? Is that interesting or not, right? And so it's actually quite interesting because it says that categories and features explain the same variance because when you add them together, they do not explain more. Now, what does that mean? So this is just a schematic summary. Um, so here I'm showing the model variance. So the, the variance that each model can explain. As you can see, there's some overlap there. And then we can show in black uh, schematically what it's explaining in IT. And we see that based on our findings, it's really the overlap between the two models that explains the variance. 
What this means is that the explanatory power of both of these models um, derives from their shared variance. And that means that only features correlated with categories explain IT. So what that indicates is that these features, it may be that IT is computing features of intermediate complexity that are somewhat easier to compute from images at least than categories, because that's really just an abstract label. Um, but those features are related to semantics. So an example of this would be, for example, an eye. Um, an eye has some specific pattern of contrast, right? So you have usually white, and then you have some darker um, circle in the middle. That's really some sort of visual feature that you could compute from the data, which are the images. And then if you see an eye, as long as you identify that, it's most likely that there's a face or almost certain, right? Because that's such a good indicator. So this suggests that visual features may serve as stepping stones towards semantics. And what IT may be doing is maybe not computing semantics directly or category labels, but it may be computing these features, extracting those from images that are actually giving our diagnostic. They're giving information about category membership. All right. Any questions at this point? Yes. Wonderful results. Did you also look at other areas to see what happens with consistent IT and yes. some of these things you'd expect? Right? And I was wondering what about other areas of interest? Yes, good question. Um, so actually the areas that are or or the results that may be most interesting is that what we also did, we didn't only look at the brain data, but we also looked at similarity judgments. So similarity judgments, we just asked people to arrange these objects like in an MES plot based on their similarity. Um, and then we explained also the judgment with these two models. And there we saw very clearly that the categories explained more variance than the features because people were arranged, they were clustering things into categories. So there is quite clear that the two models can perform differently um, depending on the type of data that you try to explain. Now, if we look at, for example, early visual cortex, what we did see there, and that's kind of interesting, in general, we saw the visual features do better than the categories because they're more related to some of the lower level features that may be represented at these stages. So we did confirm that. But then what was also interesting to some extent, and we didn't investigate that further, is that among the categories, there was a bit of a difference. If you look at the different uh, hierarchies at which you can uh, abstract from, um, basically there could be basic level categories like dog. Uh, you could also have more uh, superordinates like animate, inanimate, or you could have subordinate, which is more like a particular breed of dog, then we actually saw that the uh, superordinate categories were a bit better at explaining responses in early visual cortex. And maybe they share some visual features, maybe color, maybe general shape properties um, that actually uh, are correlated with this higher level category membership that are also represented in early visual cortex. So that was a bit unexpected, but I think this is because of correlations uh, between visual features and particular categories. Yeah. Can I have a follow-up question? Yes, of course. Yeah. So if you if you what would you expect if you run an MEG data or EEG with the same experiment, would you think this the, the overlap that you got on the fact that the network was just we we will get to that later in the talk yeah. actually um but yeah um there i'm actually not directly comparing features and categories there i'm combining them and comparing them to deep nets um but i i can say something about the features and the categories at that point as well yeah yeah maybe i didn't understand well but i thought you said for the features and the categories you ask like people to describe yeah. the object how can you be sure that those descriptions correspond to what really is treated in the brain? Yeah, yeah, that's of course something we don't know. And that is something to that we're in a way testing um, indirectly here. If they wouldn't explain any variance in the brain, then we would be concluding that maybe they weren't the best in terms of describing what people are uh, actually perceiving. And um, so, so that's something that's in a way an experimental question. We see they do explain variance, but not all of it. Um, so we're somewhere in between. Um, we do know that if we ask people to um, generate, for example, 
um, these also judgments, right, of the optic images, we do see that there's some correlation between the judgments and the brain representation. And the judgments themselves are also quite well explained by the features and the categories. So that indirectly, again, says some of this is certainly represented at the level of IT, which we also directly see, see here because it's not a known uh, existent correlation. Yeah. For follow up, um, when you showed the model for the prediction, uh, we could see that the, um, the matrix was way more structured. I mm -hmm. can say it that way. Do yeah. you think it's explained by that, or is, is it just because the complexity is not represented well in the model? Yeah, that's a good question. And it's it uh, has to be a bit of a guess, right? Um, because some of the structure that we see in the brain representations could indeed be. Some of it could be real, some of it could be noise. That is hard to say at, at um, you know, when you just see the data only. We did look at replicability of these matrices over time within individuals. So you can get some idea about how replicable it is, um, the structure that we see. And it's quite replicable, um, but it's more replicable actually um, if you look at these judgments or labels uh, versus um, the brain representation. The brain representation is a bit noisier. And um, because of the, yeah, we have to indirectly measure relativity. There's a lot of noise being added in the measurement process. Um, so in short, um, there are some differences in terms of um, how noisy the data are. Um, but some of that structure in the brain data is definitely real because it replicates, yeah, within an individual over time, also some of the finer grade structure, like within categories, for example. So my guess is that these features that people generate, so features and category labels, they may indeed just not be enough um, in terms of the, let's say, number of features and categories they're generating. We had in total about 200. It's not that much, right? It may just not be enough to explain all the variants that we do see in, in the brain representations. Yeah, yes. Uh, maybe to follow from this. So in the first step of this analysis, you're fitting the feature representations to yeah. the brain representations yeah. um, to basically get a set of weights that you can then apply on left out uh, images in the yeah. model to pr make predictions about the brain representations. Yeah. Are these weights informative? Like if you, yeah. um, I suppose you're regularizing somehow, yes. and so you might have zero weights, and wouldn't yeah. that suggest that yeah. this question or this feature mm -hmm. that? Um, yeah was yeah. answered by the participant, they didn't contribute anything to um, Yeah, the this is definitely the case. So we did look at, at the weights, but since we imposed some regular we did rate regression, so you push the weights to be small, um, which um, it helps for regularizing, but um, then it also makes it a bit harder to interpret them, but we did look at it. And we did see that um, among the object parts, uh, the features that were just thinking about like a top 10 or something, which were most having the highest weights, and they were features like um, yeah, eye or ear that are really indicative of a particular category. And um, so that was quite clear. And then uh, among the categories, for example, face has pretty uh, strong weight. And you can imagine, yeah, that is the case. If you look at these uh, matrices of the, the brain, uh, there were also features that didn't contribute that much. And that also relates to a limitation in our stimulus set. It's just 100 images. And um, that could be, therefore, that you may have prescriptions that only apply to like one image. Like there is a desk chair that's purple. So then there's purple, but it just applies to the desk chair. And then that's not gonna be very helpful if you wanna predict uh, representations to other images, uh, even within the set. So that also happened and those are less useful. And then if we had more images, then they could become more useful. Yeah. So that's some limitation, right? That we had. Yeah. All right. Let's continue. Um, so now, we're, now we get to the transformations. So how did we get from the image to that high level representation? We, we see now that what kind of categories are represented. We have an idea about what may be computed there at that higher level, but how did we get there from the image? And that's somewhat of a complicated question. As you can see, you go through all these processing stages and they're all can be thought of as transformations. Somehow there's this transformation happening from an image to some meaningful uh, representation. So let's make it a bit easier to get started with this and ask whether we can 
linearly predicts activation levels in category selected regions in IT. Um, and uh, whether we can predict that from the early visual representations in V1 and V2. So category selected regions, you may have heard about them. They are in IT and they're regions that as a whole respond more to objects from certain categories than others. So the most well-known regions would be FFA, the fusiform face area, which responds more to faces than other objects, and PPA, variable chemical place area, responds more to places and then to other optic images. And so we just want to predict the activation levels of those areas. And that simplified the problem, right? Because we, we just do part of it. I'm going from already a brain representation to also just one level of activation in a higher, uh, uh, higher level region. So let's look at early visual cortex because we haven't really seen that representation yet. We of course did measure it also with fMRI. So we can look at the pattern dissimilarities here. And I'm gonna show these again using MDS. So the images will be color coded according to their category. And here you can see that there is already some clustering happening at the level of early visual cortex. So you can see uh, faces tend to cluster, that's the red colors. And also places, they do form a cluster, that's the blue colors. So now if, if we could um, predict the activation level of, let's say, PPA, the place selective region, um, from this early representational space, then we should be able to put a ramp over this um, space in order to predict the level of activity. So I'm going to add that as a third dimension now. So the height of the bars will be the activation in PPA to these images. So what you see is yeah, that's definitely PPA. It responds more to places than other objects. Um, and now we can ask, can we place a ramp over this space? And what we see is that, yeah, we could do that. That would explain some of the height of the bars, but not all of it, because there's quite a steep drop here from the blue ones to the other colors. And that's hard to model with a ramp. You need some sort of stepwise predictor, let's say, which is a nonlinear uh, predictor. Now, uh, we shouldn't forget here uh, that we're looking at an MDS representation, which always introduces some distortions because it's a lower dimensional representation of the early visual space. And we want to uh, make sure that um, we want to use the whole dimensionality. So what we need to do in order to do that is to just compute a linear combination of these early visual voxels. Uh, to predict the activation level of PPA. And it's just basically the same thing as I just showed you in this MDS space, but now actually at the higher uh, dimensionality of the number of voxels in EVC. And now we can compute this weighted sum, a uh, linear weighted sum of the voxels to predict PPA. And then when we do that, I won't show you all the details, but when we do that, we again indeed find that good performance at explaining PPA requires a nonlinear component in the model. So what that says here is that this model is a little bit too simple. Um, so let's make it more complicated. So we could do that, for example, by first of all saying, well, PPA consists of multiple voxels, not just the region as a whole. There's regions in between, like V4. We probably need to introduce some nonlinearity because we saw that's needed. So that can be done by having these nonlinear activation functions so that the weighted linear sum uh, only gets, let's say, passed on if it passes a certain threshold. And then we want to go all the way from the image to the meaningful interpretation that could be just a label like house. Yeah, and at this point, now we basically built a deep neural network. And um, so, so that's what I want to talk about next, uh, because these are more complex models, and they may be able to do um, better at explaining these transformations than the simple model we just uh, put together in the first place. So let's discuss briefly why deep networks, deep neural networks have become so popular. So I'm sure you heard about it. I'm not sure how much you learned about them. Is that something that came up in your courses? 
hmm, maybe maybe not okay <laughs> then maybe then i sort of know what to what to um you know say so this is an example of a neural network um alex F, which was basically the first one um that really attracted the attention let's say of both computer vision scientists and neuroscientists and as you can see here's the image so that's the starting point um and then you go through multiple layers towards an output layer and that's basically the layer that represents category labels so as you can see even though it looks quite abstract here this model is is actually inspired loosely by the ventral visual stream because it does have multiple regions um, layers and it also has these units within the layers they're like neurons you could say and the weights there's weights between these different uh, units in the in the model and these could be trained um, through experience so you can think of those as synapses maybe that are just based on learning so what happens is now once you've trained this model, then you can actually provide it with an image and it will give you a category label that it thinks describes the object in the image best. So why is this quite useful? Um, well, what's very nice about this model is that it's image computable, which means we can give it an image and then it computes a category label for us. Um, and that's um, very comparable to what our brains are doing, right? We see an image and then we get this meaningful interpretation that clearly contains categorical information. And if you think about our feature and category models, they're not image computable. We just get labels. We don't really know how they were computed from the image. The people did that for us, right? They're computationally explicit, so we know exactly how the model is built. We know after training what its weights are. And um, so that's all explicit and that's useful. It just um, really also pushes the researcher to specify that. Um, and you could imagine that whatever you specify may be driven by hypotheses you have about how the visual system may work. And then importantly, these models also reach human level performance on object categorization and previous computational models of the ventral visual system were not able to do as well as humans so that was also good because this means hmm, maybe this is actually a useful model to try and use for explaining our brain representations and basically to model the transformation from an image to this high level representation so it definitely attracted the interest of neuroscientists who then asked can these deep neural networks also explain brain representation because they weren't trained to do that they were just trained to categorize objects and they have an architecture that's loosely inspired by our ventral visual stream. So would that lead to the same representations? What do you think? Is that sufficient? <laughs> Possibly. Um, let's have a look. Um, so here are the predictions of AlexNet, which has eight layers um, of the IT optic representation. So what we did here, so this is IT. But now what we can do is we can provide the same images that we showed to our human participants, but we give them to AlexNet now. And AlexNet is going to compute a category label. But in the meantime, it's doing that um, by having activity across its layers, like in the, in the brain, so there's activity across the units in the network. And we just can measure that activity, which gives us response patterns, so we can compute these RDMs again. But now for each layer of the network and for each image, and then we get this RDM for all the images together. This is the first layer of the network. So the only structure we really easily see here is the human faces. They're clustering because possibly because they're visually quite similar. And that continues in its next layers. There's some changes in the structure, but more changes start to emerge in the later layers where we get closer to this category label output, which is FC8. And here you can see things become quite, quite categorical uh, because you can see more structure in there. So now what we did is we linearly combined these layers um, to predict IT. And then we can add this to our produced plot. Let's show up here. 
uh, what are we going to see? Is it going to be as good as categories and features? Or is it going to be better, worse? What do you think? Make a wild guess. Sure you hope better. You hope better. That's right. Um, here's what happened. It's not better, <laughs> but but I shouldn't be discouraged because it did significantly correlate its prediction uh, with the IT representation. And actually, it turns out if you do the statistic, it's not significantly different from the others. Um, so that's actually not the worst result. Um, and why is that still quite impressive? It's because, well, here with the features and the categories, to some extent, I don't want to say we treat it, but we ask people right to generate these features and categories. And this network doesn't know anything about that. And it has to compute all the way from the image um, towards the output. And then if it's doing that, it actually can still, uh, it can do quite well at explaining these representations. But there's a gap, right? It's pretty substantial with the noise ceiling. It's definitely not up there. So <laughs> I guess here the conclusion is that these deep convolutional neural networks are promising models of human visual cortex, but we're not there yet. So if I give an overview of what we discussed so far, uh, for the population codes, we saw that we can investigate those uh, with representational similarity analysis. And that's where we see um, we can compute these dissimilarities uh, between response patterns. And that can give us an idea of what kind of information a particular brain region represents. Then we can use that to look at object information in high level visual cortex which emphasizes these categories of ecological relevance, like faces or animate objects. And then um, we also saw that it's most likely, or there's at least some evidence in our uh, results that what IT may be computing to get to that representation is these object features of intermediate complexity that are correlated with categories. And then we started to model these representational transformations to get to that high level representation. And deep neural networks are quite useful models there. Um, so we could end here, but I think there's more to say. So let's start talking a bit more about the deep neural network. So how excited should, should we actually be about that? I think quite excited because of what I just showed you. But um, we also know that deep neural networks leave important aspects of the human brain data, as we already just saw and also behavior unexplained. So just to give you an idea, right, in terms of behavior, how they differ, I put some images together from different papers that show these differences between humans and deep neural networks. And uh, this is one of them. So I'm gonna show them now sequentially and you can just say to yourself, you know, what, what is shown here? See if you can do it. The first one was easy. <laughs> I'll show you the labels that humans usually give. So that's the labels. Um, I think most of these were relatively easy to recognize. Um, now, if we provide these images to deep neural networks, then we get answers maybe like this. Um, so question mark just means they got it wrong, but I don't know exactly what they said instead. Um, but here, for example, the first one is a bit unfair actually uh, because this is an example of something called an adversarial adversarial example um where we in with intent change the image for the network to give a different response but we change it in many places we change it a little bit everywhere so it goes towards that different response and we humans don't even see it and um, so we would make a change that's imperceptible to us to actually lead to the right answer for the network but we don't see that but then uh, the second image is just noise. Um, and to get the correct answer, we need to reduce the level of noise to about this level. So much more easily visible, right? Now the third image is showing that deep neural networks tend to over rely on texture. So they think this is an elephant. Um, you can train them explicitly to not do this. Um, so you could think of them taking a shortcut in a way. But again, we can't really blame them because we just provide them with images during training. And if we never try to dissociate the texture from, for example, shape, they may not learn this, right? So either you need to train them like that explicitly, yeah, or show the actual texture. This one is just a little harder because 
the elephant is somewhere to the side. So here now a network would be much better able to say that this is an elephant. And for this one, we either need to make change uh, not have occlusion basically, or we can maybe add some recurring connections to the network. And that means that different units in the network can talk to each other, um, not only in a feed forward way, which means you go from the image to the output, but also either in a lateral way. So within a layer, different units could communicate or even top down from a higher to a lower layer. And we know that those connections of course exist in the human brain. Uh, we also have lots of indications they're functionally relevant, uh, but in a network standard date, they're not really included yet. So now how are we gonna go from here? I guess let's stay here for a moment um, because basically we see there's room for improvement. So what can we now start doing to improve um, this match between the networks and the humans? And the reason, of course, we want to do that is we want to create better models of visual um, cognition, because then we can also start to better understand how humans do this. Now, one way, this is just a small uh, step, but what we did is we tried to start figuring out what are these networks missing in the brain data? What are they not explaining that we could explain with other things and those other things are going to be features and categories. So what we did, first of all, we went to MEG data. Uh, so now we shouldn't forget, of course, that these representations are dynamic. So as soon as you show an image, um, you get a response in the brain and it's going to unfold over time. And that's important because that's some aspect of the variance we're missing with fMRI data. Um, and there's certainly Generally, um, I would say these representational dynamics are thought to reflect the underlying neural computations. And so we do want to capture those and they may help us give us more information to figure out what's missing. So this is data from um, that was originally acquired by Radha Kichi and a later source reconstructed by Tim Kitman. And what we have here now, we see now RDMs for three different stages of the processing um, hierarchy, early, intermediate, high level, um, and they're going to evolve over time. So let me show that to you, just to get an idea of the dynamics. Let's see. So first, there's no information. I should mention uh, it is time after stimulus onset. So about 50 milliseconds, you'll see after stimulus onset, you see structure, and then it goes quickly from early to mid to high level human faces. Now they become very different from other objects, right? Now you see uh, animacy structure here. Uh, you'll also see in a moment that you get more of the four squares, which is also animate faces, clustering with human faces, animal faces. And then here you see animacy again. And um, so over time, you see that the information changes. Uh, so you go from human faces clustering to human faces also becoming different from other things um, to also seeing animacy. And this is all happening at different moments in time. And you can also see that there are differences in what information is represented across these different stages of processing. So I also, yeah, I think it's probably, we should probably move on. Um, there's also these MDS plots as we saw before. So they are, of course, also animated. Maybe I'll show you briefly. Yeah, um, which show clustering, right? So not much happening here, beginning, right? Now you get these faces clustering, for example, here, and they move at some point apart. Like here, they're now different from all the others, right? And you can just see different uh, structure evolving over time. Now, what we did next is to actually model these dynamic representations in the same way as we did before. So we have the features and the categories, which uh, we're now all putting together in this visual semantic model. And we have a deep neural network, in this case, Cornet. Um, so these are specifically built to have a very similar architecture to the human ventral system and also the primate ventral system. And we have two versions here, feed forward only and also locally recurrent. So what I was just talking about within a layer, units can talk to each other over time. And we put all of these together 
So what we did again is that we weighted all the features and categories together, or all the layers, also different time steps of these networks to explain this dynamic object representation at each point in time and at each stage of cortical processing. Now, let's show you what happens. And um, so here I'm now plotting unique variants explained by each of the two model classes over time. Each stimulus was shown for 500 milliseconds. And in blue, you'll see the visual semantic model explained variants. And then in green, you'll see uh, the deep neural networks. So which do you think is going to do better? This is early visual cortex. Ah, let's see. No, <laughs> but it's a good thing. Uh, so the reason that that probably isn't the case. So you can see that overall, the deep neural network does better, especially early here in the response. Um, I also have here on top, you can see whenever they're explaining more variants um, than expected based on uh, baseline, basically zero. But you can see that especially early in the response, the deep neural network really does explain more variants. And it's somewhat expected, maybe, um, because the deep neural network, it goes from an image to a category label. So it does have to, to compute the whole transformation, which also means whatever is happening in our individual cortex needs to compute that part of the transformation too. And the higher level features and categories, they're already more at the end stage of processing, you could imagine, where people generate these labels once they've interpreted the image. So that's a way to explain it. Now for intermediate visual cortex, uh, we see that they're getting a bit more similar in the amount, let's say, of variance they explain. But you still see that early on, the deep neural network is explaining more variance than the visual semantic models. And then there's some, some peaks a bit later for the visual semantic information explaining the dynamics in P4. And now once we get to IT, now we see clearly the visual semantic model is doing better uh, than the DNS. And that's across the entire time course, basically. Um, so what we're seeing here is that we see this reversal in a way when we go up the ventral visceral hierarchy from DNS explaining early visual representational dynamics better to the visual semantic models explaining the high level visual uh, dynamics better. So this suggests one thing that may be missing, right, is some of the visual, visual semantic information at higher level stages of processing may not really be present in the DNNs. And that somewhat relates also to some of findings, right, that, for example, they rely more on texture uh, than on maybe shape or other information, as we just saw with the elephant cat example. Um, and texture is somewhat lower level. Um, so this says that visual semantic models and DNNs actually seem to be explaining some complementary representational variants uh, in the dynamics, at least. We didn't see this as strongly, right, in the fMRI uh, data. But now when we have this additional amount of temporal information, we can start to see the differences between the two models in terms of what they explain. Yes. Does yes. This with the recurrence? Oh, this is uh, both. So we yeah, local uh, recurrence uh, is included. Yeah. I have a very basic question. Of course. Yeah. Just to make sure I understood. Um, is it because the like the words, the categories are already already representing like much more complex um, stimuli than the the networks? Yeah. So the idea I think indeed is that uh, in the networks you have uh, it's of course a bigger now. There's like well, there's at least four different layers, but you do get this. Um, representation that goes from the image all the way to the label. So it will also have some lower level stages of processing. Um, and that's less the case here potentially, uh, because these are in these higher level features. Uh, I don't know if that's exactly yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so this DNN that you use to compare with the brain activity, did you retrain it on these images or? No, 
we didn't. No. no so it's not very terrible. Yeah. Terrible. Yeah. So this is of course uh, true. So there, uh, those DNNs were trained on ImageNet, which is indeed the standard. So this is uh, one million images of objects um, in scenes. And then uh, the networks uh, learn to categorize those images into a thousand classes. And of course, whenever you have a um, mismatch, for example, based on the different categories, right, that were either trained, that the network learned, um, and that we see quite prominently in the human representation, there is a mismatch, which there is. Um, then, of course, that disadvantages makes the network a basically come at a disadvantage because of that, right? And there's quite a few reasons uh, why it may be a disadvantage, and this is where we can make improvements. Yeah. Yeah, because, yeah, in more detail, so if you use ImageNet classes, there's a thousand of them. I think about a hundred of them are different species of dogs. 200. Yeah, or 200, yeah. So that's a lot, right? And that's really not really what people expect. Maybe if you're a dog expert, <laughs> but otherwise probably that's not really what we're representing. And uh, yeah, that may make it um, to be somewhat disadvantaged. And that disadvantage, I do think, would be expected to be more pronounced at higher level processing stages, because these lower level stages, they can they capture lower level, let's say, image statistics maybe, which are probably still quite similar between the images we're using and the images in ImageNet. But the closer you get to this part where things become more categorical, the stage of processing, yeah, then you get potentially more differences. Yeah. Uh, so yes. I mean, uh, if I look at the IT result that you get from MEG, um, and I, you know, go back in my mind to the result you showed with fMRI and AlexNet. Yeah. Yeah. Um, of course, the unit changed now on the y-axis. Yeah. It's in living parents explained, so it's a bit hard to compare. But yeah. you seem to be doing better with AlexNet um, in the fMRI. So, do you think that this is because the source reconstructed MEG is maybe more noisy than um, the region of interest, you know, in fMRI? Um, or, you know, that only having those four layers in Cornet, I mean, the number of parameters is not the same, the model depth is not the same. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, this could all contribute, right? And it is true that the um, axes are a bit, so this is a unique variance explain, which is variance that each of them, so there's no, there will be some overlapping variance that they explain. Um, that's not in here. Although I have to say for IT, it's not a lot of overlapping variance. It's still clearly, it looks very similar to this actually if we just do the total variance explained. Um, so that would say that that's not it, right? And then if you look at uh, what we saw before, um, we could see that in terms of the direction, um, at least that is you know, yeah. consistent. It is lower, but, and this is uh, not significant here. But of course, yeah, we're, Data, both the fMRI and the MET data are noisy, of course. So, so I could speculate, as you say, it could be because the network is slightly different. Um, it could be because maybe in the representational uh, dynamics, we do have some more information about how things evolve over time. Maybe that helps, um, but it, it's hard to say what is causing these, let's say, different interpretations. It could still be here. Um, that if you would ask for unique variance um, between these two, um, that you could still find something that goes in that direction. And that's, um, if I remember correctly, we did look at this some time ago. I do think each explains some unique variance, um, but I, I'm not sure if it was so clear that the categories explained much more or significantly more unique variance. Yeah, so that's something to look into. Yeah. Yeah, so just to summarize, I thought it's probably good to have a summary figure because it's quite a bit of information just for the MEG data. Um, so it's subtracted. I mean, basically, this is unique variance, but a different score. So um, positive de re deflections here mean that the deep neural networks explain more variance. Negative deflections mean that the visual semantic model explains more variance. And then um, now we can see these different regions. Um, so 
for V1, V3, V, and DC, it's always the DNN explaining more variants, and it's early in the response, before about 120 milliseconds, maybe. And we do know that period of time generally is thought to be mostly capturing before processes and locally recurrent processes, which the DNN can, based on its architecture, both model. Now for V4, indeed, we see this early part of the visual response is very similar in terms of uh, V1 and uh, 2 3 but then we see this switch towards the visual semantic model starting to explain more later in time. For IT, we see this, which we already also noticed, but it's very clear um, that it's the visual semantic model explaining more variants uh, than the DNN. And we see that peak, the first big peak, is a bit later in time, around 120 milliseconds maybe. Now what we can do is ask where are these peaks? So this is the peak in IT. Now what we can do is say, hmm, um, how does this relate to the direction of information flow? Feed forward versus feedback. And this is something actually Tim already analyzed in his previous paper. So we can put that here in the figure. And he used Granger causality analysis to uh, compute that. And he got these windows where um, we can say there's predominantly feed forward versus predominantly feedback flow of information. And we're looking specifically now between these two regions. So feed forward, that's this window going from V4 to IT. So that's before the peak in IT. Now we see this peak in V4. Now let's look at the feedback time window. And that's actually here just before that peak in V4. So this is all very suggestive, but we may want to make a very speculative claim here and see that um, it could be that there's maybe visual semantic feedback from IT to V4. And we're currently doing some analyses to see if that's indeed coming out if we try to test for this explicitly or more explicitly. But that's kind of interesting. Um, so that you see this feed forward sweep of information, then there's a peak in, v in, in IT, and then you see feedback, and then you get a peak in V4. So next steps, because this suggests some next steps. One is, well, you should also model top-down feedback because that's expected to happen more in, after that first um, window up till maybe 120 milliseconds. Um, feedback is there. You can see that at that point, at least in higher level visual regions, there isn't really much of an advantage at all of the DNNs, right? It's the opposite. So that's possibly something that's missing. So we want to include also top-down feedback. And then the other one is kind of general, right? And this is related also to one of the earlier comments. So we probably need to provide these networks with a more human-like learning experience. Because at the moment, what do they learn? They see lots of images, about a million. They learn what the category label is supposed to be for each of these images, adjust their weight so that they get good at this task. Then they can do it for new images. They can categorize them quite well. Um, however, if you think about the human visual experience, that's quite limited, right? What the networks get to see. And um, if you, for example, obviously they're not seeing movies, um, it's only supervised training. Well, for humans, there is a lot of unsupervised learning, most likely, right? Self-supervised before you can talk. Um, you're seeing already uh, the visual world and you're learning from that, right? You're learning their structure in there. And only later, you may get some feedback from your parents. And that's more of the supervised learning, right? Where they point maybe and say, that's a dog. Uh, that's the way that the networks are trained. But they're not really learning themselves um, from visual information that would be more realistic if they would, for example, be videos. And of course, there's work going on in different labs uh, across uh, the world, right? To get this, uh, basically create a better match between the learning experience of humans and deep neural networks. And of course, there's many things that we could look at there and improve. But my expectation is, of course, that these are all going to help. It's a bit hard to say which ones are most important, but I think they're all um, moves, you know, towards the right direction for creating better models. 
And um, I think that's where I want to leave because now it's 4.10, I think. So it's time to stop. So thank you uh, for coming to the talk. And also thank you to my collaborators and funders. Okay. So uh, you can ask your question in French or English. Go ahead. Well, I was wondering uh, for the next step, yes. uh, do you have any concrete tests, uh, especially for the second point, but the first one too? Yeah, so for, for the second point, what we're currently doing in the lab is um, first we uh, try to, or we implement it on supervised learning methods. So one of these uh, methods that's currently quite popular is contrastive learning. And that means that you provide the networks with two versions of the same image. So you have an image and then you do some, what they refer to as data augmentations. So you can either maybe uh, zoom and crop, uh, you could maybe change the color a little bit or make it grayscale. And these changes, um, you can create, if you use them, different versions of the same image. And these methods, they then um, have a slightly different way of learning Basically what you train them to do with uh, self-supervised learning is that you say, hmm, these two versions of the same image, they should elicit similar representations high up in the network. And um, if you have versions of different images, which also have multiple versions, but they are all different. So they should elicit different response patterns. And that's the way they're trained. And that's what we've been implementing. And what's interesting is that you see that if you do that, you do get representations that look like we see in the human brain. For example, what is quite good is that these networks can pick up on not just human faces, but also faces in general. So animal and human faces, they cluster those faces. And that's something that the supervised methods don't really uh, lead to, given the way they're trained, which is those thousand object categories in image. Um, so that's quite interesting. Now, the second thing we're adding is, yeah, time, so movies. Then you can start to learn to teach these networks to actually process movies, potentially in combination with this unsupervised learning. And then we want to see if that creates even more human-like representations. So that's currently what we're doing. Yeah. have a sort of a common question. Yes. Uh, so I'm not entirely sure how you created your feature model. Yeah. So let, let me explain to you what I understood and tell me if that's what you've done. So I, what I think you did is that you asked your participants, what are the features of these objects? Um, and they listed a number of features and yeah. then uh, you use this matrix of features and uh, you try to uh, optimize the weights yes. to predict brain activity. Yeah. Did yeah, that's correct. So yeah. um, it is indeed the case we gave them as clear instructions as possible. So we did say, uh, please mention um, components of these objects that are yeah. visible. So don't provide a label for the whole object and it should be something that's visible. Um, and then we gave some examples of each of these options. So yeah. cards or colors or textures, but that's the level at which we, we did that. And then we did have a two-step procedure where first we let a certain set of subjects generate these labels. And then we had a second set that was validating them and only when they were also validated then we included them, but that is indeed the procedure, yeah. <laughs> and then we ended up with about 110 categories. So did you optimize them by layer or? Uh, oh, yeah. So, so okay, for explaining. Yeah. yeah. So um, we optimize them uh, for explaining the uh, brain data just by weighting all the features in the categories. Um, but then in terms of the deep neural networks, we did do some work, which I didn't show here, where we also fit these feature and category models to uh, deep networks. And there we did it per layer. Um, but um, then the, uh, what I showed here was to also fit the models, the, the deep neural networks to explain the brain data. And that there we did it at the level of the layers. Yeah. Um, in some of our research, we also did it at the level of the units. 
so that makes you more flexible. Um, but then you run into more easily into overfitting and you need to regularize more. It doesn't always improve the prediction if you weight all the individual units, but this is certainly an approach that people take. Also, for example, Jim Carlos that does that, um, and it makes you more flexible. And then you could, of course, argue, well, if you would do that, maybe you would explain more in the brain representation. And that is a good point. So this really brings us to the question of what we think is a good model. Should it be a model that, without doing too much extra stuff, like the weighting, already explains the brain representations well? Or are we happy enough if we either have linear combinations of features that are in there that still explain the brain data well, or maybe even some nonlinear combination. There's all these different levels. Yeah. I actually prefer the latter. So what you've done essentially. So when you, if I understood correctly what you just said, you optimize them on the, the categories. Yes. Okay. So I have three comments to make yes. about uh, this thing. <laughs> the first one is that feature, I think, is uh, not the right choice of word. I would have said parts mm -hmm. uh, because that, that fits better with uh, you know, the categorization literature. The second. Um, Maybe I can briefly say something about it. Yeah. I think that makes sense. Uh, absolutely. Also, if you look at, so there were some descriptions of textures or colors, but the majority of the descriptions yeah. indeed are optic parts. And also, if you look at the MEG data, ex um, those uh, subsets of features that do explain this unique variance, and I think they're the optic parts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, that's consistent with what you suggest. Yeah. Right. Um... Yeah, so I mean, it, it depends how you ask it. But anyway, that, that's kind of a secondary comment. So the two main comments are that first, you uh, you ask the participant to list these features. So I, I think uh, it's not the ideal approach because uh, you're asking them to rely on introspection. Yeah. And yeah. I'm assuming that most of these participants actually thought about the categories that they these objects fell into and try to come up with the list of features that uh, are important for this category. Um, so that's not ideal because you're actually uh, increasing artificially the, the correlation between the category and uh, the, the feature by doing it this way. Whereas if you start with a large collection of features uh, and that's your feature model um, and they're uncorrelated to speak with the categories, then you know you you have a better chance, I think, of having a different model. And I think this problem was increased in in your model uh, by the fact that you fitted these features to the categories. And what's a category if not? I mean, if you believe in classic uh, categorization uh, theories, if not a collection of features that are weighted differently. So exactly what you've done. So in a way, um, may, maybe there were incomplete definition of these categories, but they were approximate definition of your categories. So yeah. the human brains, uh, they were very similar. So the fact that you find a high correlation between the two, it's not, in my mind, too surprising. Yeah, I definitely agree that it, that is what may certainly be happening. In some ways, I still think that that is quite interesting that you do have um, descriptions that you can have of what, uh, let's say, object parts, and that if you combine them and weight them appropriately, they actually capture categories. And that seems to be the case that if you do this for IT, if you fit to IT, because we're not, we're not fitting to, we're not fitting the features to the categories, but we are fitting each of them to IT, which is categorical in this representation. Um, but when you do this, then you see that, yeah, they do explain the same variance. Um, and if you fit, for example, to judgments, that's not the case. Those are more categorical. Um, so it's quite interesting to see that at the level of the brain, you do get that, um, where you do see that the features and the categories can explain the same variance. But it's not the case in the behavioral output that you get when you ask people to generate similarity judgments without too much additional instruction um, of how they should do this. Um, so that's nice to see that they can behave differently and that uh, the output that people give, um, it's actually more, it's more categorical than what we see in the brain. Um, so, so that I do think together is interesting, but I agree with you that, yeah, probably the, the features that people generate either because they were thinking of categories, but maybe that's exactly what people are centrally doing, 
right? Then they may provide those features or optic parts. Um, and that's, again, one of these points that they will name mostly those that are related to categories. Mm -hmm. um, so you can then, be, of course, ask, well, didn't we already go? That's yeah. a, neat, a, a separate question. And you could say- I, I agree with yeah. you that it's not uninteresting, mm -hmm. but it's not, in, from what I understood from what you were saying, what you were really aiming at. You were re really aiming at uh, a different type of model than the categorization model. It because would be of nice the... to have a model, indeed, I agree with that. And that. I would like to have a model that is a feature, like a back of feature model or something, mm -hmm. right? Um, but, but indeed, then the question becomes, how do you build that model? Uh, do you want to do this maybe uh, based on extracting low-level visual properties? And so then you're also uh, limited to a particular model that you have, which in a way the DNN is doing. Yeah, exactly. um, so, so then uh, that is nice to have. And that is also interesting to see that um, that does yield different results. Um, of course, for the DNN results, everything was included, all the different layers were included. We did also look uh, more specifically about matches between early layers, for example, and uh, early vision cortex. Um, and then you can see some differences. Um, but that is something that you could do. Um, and of course, then the question is still, how do I create the best feature model? And it's actually quite tricky um to to uh, to get to a good model but you could think of models like that that are actually extracting features from the image maybe still after being trained on categories um and maybe you can also train these networks of course to do different things not categorization and then you can see how similar are the features that are extracted at these lower levels the lower levels i think they'll be similar um the end task may not matter as much but it's true that if you get higher up, that's going to matter. And then you may be able to just find these results for those networks that were trained to categorize and maybe not for networks that were trained to do something else, like maybe identification or um, location of objects. And that would be interesting. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Um, one more question and then yeah. we'll uh, continue the discussion yes. with refreshment. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Very, very uh, good talk. Thank you very much. Um, I just, it's, it's essentially a follow up on what yeah. Rick was talking about. Uh, yeah. it, it sounds like your view might be that essentially uh, in IT features are extracted, but maybe that extra step of like categorizing uh, like the object per se, like maybe the, ex the, the outer layer of a deep neural net would occur somewhere else. Is that what you Actually, yeah, you could imagine. Yeah, that's a good question. So I indeed would think about the representation in IT as being a representation where you can read this out in one step. So that would then be an additional uh, step where in the brain the question is, where is this, right? Mm -hmm. um, that's somewhat tricky because it's more distributed, I think, than we... Than we but it's very, it's very nice with the results that you were showing with the feedback, right? It yeah. seems like it could like be like that signal coming from elsewhere. Like, Yes, that's possible. Yeah, so it's it is possible, and of course, when you are actually making um, explicit responses, yeah, you will involve regions in other parts of the brain, like prefrontal or motor regions. Um, and uh, yeah, the thought would be that um, these regions can flexibly read out from this representation in IT, which is somewhat multi. Uh, factorial, or it has information about multiple things, which include both category information, but also identity or other uh, information about objects. Um, that then some higher level combination of regions can read out in one step, and it can just have different readout filters to do the task that you're currently doing on the objects. Yeah, that would be the idea. That's pretty cool. Okay. Great. We'll actually take one more question. Yes. So I like to so <laughs> remain thirsty for a little while longer. So uh, it's a yeah. question from. Uh, uh, so John Webbinsby is asking what is the level of thorough computing and the level of serial computing in the human brain learning model? <laughs> yeah, um, in the human brain in general. Yeah, that's kind of. A, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's not an easy question to answer. Uh, of course. Um, I think we can think of both going on, right? The fact that there is this hierarchy, at least for the ventral visual system, is uh, indicating that there may be some serial processing going on because you go from the different processing stages and then you get subsequent transformation being implemented. At the same time, of course, we're, yeah, we're having a lot of 
uh, neurons uh, in the networks represented by these units, they're doing parallel computations. And uh, we do see often, again, also here in what I presented, that it's patterns across neurons of activity that contain information. Um, and of course, it doesn't mean that an individual neuron doesn't have any information. But um, if you really want a representation of the objects that is somewhat redundant and robust, and uh, then you end up being at this level of the population of neurons. So in that sense, you could think of it as being parallel. So I would say they're both both there. <laughs> but yeah, um, I guess the difference, you know, relative contributions, it's a little tricky to say. Um, yeah, they're both important. Thank you.